We thank the organizers of Exarch for this opportunity to present an aspect of our research, which has examined the function of artifacts over a period of time. And to do that, we integrate primitive technology with indigenous material knowledge. By way of background, this research is part of the Deep Roots project. The project examines the transition from the Ashelaean to the Middle Stone Age in central Southern Africa. We will be dating sites, looking at pale environmental evidence, but as we'll discuss in this paper, we're examining artifact function to help us understand the transition, why some artifacts disappear from the archeological record and others continue to be made. Across the transition, the classic bifaces, such as the hand axe and the cleaver, disappear. But there's an interesting form here, which is regionally specific, called a corax. We want to know why this particular artifact continues to be made. It originates in the late Ashland, continues through the Middle Stone Age in this part of Africa. To help us address this question, we are integrating indigenous material knowledge, particularly of woodlands and wooden objects and tool making, and use wear analysis and experimental archaeology. The project has two research areas, here in the south, Victoria Falls, and in the north, more than a thousand kilometers away, Colombo Falls. I'll just show you some images of the two regions so you get a feeling for the research context. Victoria Falls here on the left, a spectacular feature of the Zambezi River. From an archaeological perspective, as we step back up the Zambezi, there are deep deposits here of sand. Sand probably blown in from the Kalahari, we're investigating the source. The sands over 34 meters contain at the base, Ashelaean, then transition, and the materials running through time. So this material, somewhere in the order of 500,000 to maybe late Holocene or 2,000 years ago at the top. The northeastern aspect of the project of Colombo Falls is based on excavations in the small Colombo Basin behind the lip of the falls there. The basin preserves sediments of the late Ashelaean overlain by Middle Stone Age. And here's an example of an investigation by a particular site in the Colombo Falls Basin in which late Ashland artifacts are being recovered, including things like this very fresh quartzite cleaver. The broader ecological context of the project is represented in this image here of a woodland canopy, a seasonal dry woodland, which is known as Miombo locally. And it's one that stretches from Angola on the west all the way to Mozambique on the east. It's the largest floral zone in Africa. 56% of Zambia's population today works in this woodland, lives in this woodland, and has a deep craft knowledge of this huge resource. And it's that knowledge we will tap into as part of this project. The woodland is also, is also important for linking the present to the past. The Miombo vegetation mix is represented 400,000 years ago in the paleoenvironmental record of Colombo Falls. So what we are observing today helps increase the power of the inferences we draw for the archaeological record based in this kind of landscape. This is John Kanyata. He is a farmer who lives outside Livingston, and he brings to the project expertise in the working of wood. In this case, he is using an axe to shape a root, a tree root, for making a handle for other axes and also for adzes. And from talking to people like John, we have this growing list of plant species, tree species, which provide the materials for making handles for tools, for binding tools, and the adhesives or the gums that are used today for inserting and fixing axe blades and axe handles. And sorry, adds handles, adds blades. This is John's toolkit, looking a little bit more closely. And you'll see there are strips of bark. They have contemporary use as a binding material. And we will be using this. We'll be integrating the bark binding into our understanding, particularly of the corax. So we have here from this collected indigenous knowledge here, information which helps us understand that the making of hafted tools. And you'll see shortly why that's relevant. The corax. Now back to this unusual artifact form. You can see here that this object in profile is asymmetrical. In plan view, looking down from the top, it is symmetrical like a hand axe, but in side view, it's asymmetrical with a heavy backing at the, this point here. And then the tip here is created by the removal of flakes here and underneath, which effectively lift up the convex working edge from the main base of the tool. You can see this uplift here from a piece from Victoria Falls. 
It's not as pronounced as the one on the left, but it's the same process with some removals under here, isolating this convex strong working edge. We wondered if this unusual feature, I'm calling it the uplift, asymmetrical uplift, has relevance to the functioning of the artifact. In particular, does it have relevance to hafting? Does it lift the tip above the handle when used in a particular arrangement? So these are questions we need help answering. And we brought some experimentally made core axes to John. Given he's hafting axes, using an inclusion haft here, digging in basically a, a hole to receive the axe and then filling it. And then John's knowledge here of using the roots. This, this bulbous end of the root is extremely strong and designed to take the pounding of the um, contact of, of an axe or adze. And we asked John to take the replicas, fit them into handles without saying what kind of haft arrangement we would prefer. So this is his own expertise being applied to these particular objects. And he came back with core axe fitted in this sense with the long axis of the blade in line with, with the handle. This is the standard axe arrangement that John uses. Um, as you can also see here, there is some additional material. Here's a close up around the insert into the uh, into the handle into this half there's adhesive john recognized the need for adding the adhesive to secure this large asymmetrical working bit this arrangement failed fairly quickly within 30 seconds of light use against wood the insert started to wobble to wiggle and within two and a half minutes it became non-functional basically the corax drops out Carl Lee is our embedded primitive technologist, and he brings to the project almost three decades of expertise in making tools, but also using them. And Carl asked John to make a different kind of haft arrangement. So instead of pushing the artifact into the wood, it sits on the wood in this L-shaped or a juxtaposed haft. It is then bound and connected to the handle and the haft. So this would be used for our experimental research on the effectiveness of the hafting of the Corex. Before we move on, just mention that Carl used the bark strips that are soaked and then when wet, bound around the corax to hold the object to the handle. When dried, the hold looked pretty tight, but in reality, the working edge became loose within the binding very quickly. Now that's interesting and may leave use wear traces in the future for when once examined the difference between vegetable halves and halves made of a rawhide. But for our experiments, we needed to go for something that we knew would work well. Carl managed to source skin and basically produce rawhide strips. Within three days of, of drying, we had a very secure binding of the working of the corax edge into the juxtaposed handle. A couple of experiments were tried before the artifacts are, 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 are with artifacts that are not hafted. So digging, how effective are they at digging? How effective are they at chopping wood? Um, and then comparing those, those two activities with, with the hafted example. Without going into the details of the results, I'll just say that when the object is hafted, it's more effective in both of those activities. There was no failure of the haft or the binding of the rawhide bind. This video shows uh, the use of one of these hafted replica coraxes in the act of um, digging. We were taking turns. Behind here is Martha Kayoni from the University of Zambia. Um, in the front here is Chris Scott, a PhD student at the University of Liverpool, who's doing use wear analysis on bifaces. And then comes my turn at this tool. So let's get Chris started here. This is good. No, it's the first time anybody's tried this. That's what makes the whole project quite interesting. Yeah. Because you're getting into the practical stuff. Yeah. What's this used for? Too much of theory. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> still intactable. No obvious macroscopic use for yet. Be ironic if you hit a Corax in there, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, it was ironic because I took over, and within a couple of minutes of uh, digging, I struck the end of a cleaver and I broke it. Um, <laughs> the modern meets the past uh, in real life. Let's look at Chris 
applying a, a shorter handle um, and using a hafted core axe to chop a sapling. And here he's already cut down the sapling and removed a large branch. I just want to show you how effective this edge is in cutting into the wood. The uplift has its, has its moment here. And within two more blows, <clears throat> excuse me, the corax would cut right through the wood. It's a nice clean cut. It's a very effective woodworking tool. Moving quickly to Colombo Falls, excavations here in 2019 produce very fresh late ash, late ash large bifaces. And Maggie Katongo from the Livingston Museum is holding an example of a cleaver that was produced partly using soft hammer flake removal. There are no antlers in the, in the African record, and which limits the options for soft hammer to other, other forms of stone, uh, wood or bone. We're gonna take the wood option given we're in this Myomba woodland, um, and we need help to identify what might be an appropriate wood source. And that help comes from Alfred Mui Manzi, who is a, a, a local craftsman who brings the knowledge of, of the woodlands to producing handles and a variety of different tasks. And here he's, he comes to us with, uh, with already with a, a, a surface biface that he picked up. And he said, this is how I think these things would have been hafted. But we're really interested in the tools that will make a hammer. Um, and this particular tree here of a kind listed here, Terracarpus tinctorius, is of extremely hard wood. Um, and we struggled even to cut the dead branch. Um, this material would then provide the soft hammer for experimental biface making to create a reference collection for use wear analysis and particularly for identifying production wear before looking at any signs of direct use. So Carl here is replicating bifaces, including cleavers, using this wooden hammer. Um, here he's removed a beautiful tranche flake and some of the results this work feeding into use wear analysis will be seen shortly by um, some images from from Noura from Tracer Lab at Liège. Um, Noura is examining in the field, and here she is at Colombo Falls, um, examining um, the artifacts as they're coming from the site, from the excavation, to identify those with with the, with the best potential for use wear. Um, but survival, but also she's examining the material that Carl is producing, and she's doing that still now at the Tracio lab. Nora plays an important role here because she's not examining not just Ashley material, but also Middle Stone Age tools, so, so fulfilling a key aim of the, of the project. Some initial observations here. These are classic bending fractures caused here by the soft hammer in quartzite. On the edge of the quartz are also the residues of the soft hammer, um, and they are masking in part some abrasion before the, the, the striking of uh, shaping flakes. So finally, what have we learned from this project? We learned that local material knowledge informs our experimental design and our understanding of the artifacts, in particular the case of the corax. We think there is within this artifact type, um, a core adds a, a very good woodworking tool, whether hafted or not. Um, and that feeds into the, the question of why does the corax continue to be made into the Middle Stone Age? It's very, it's a, as I say, very effective at either digging or um, contacting a hard material. And as we saw with Colombo Falls, local material knowledge is feeding into the creation of ex, a use where experimental reference collection, which is invaluable for us to generate reliable and robust interpretations of dual function. And finally, I just step back and say, if you as an archaeologist have the opportunity to work somewhere where there is extant material knowledge, and you have the funding to let you bring somebody like a Carl, who is a, an expert, try it, do so. Um, the results are so much more satisfying than, um, well, from my experience, from the, the standard um, fieldwork arrangement that, that I've been used to over, over some years. 
for the for the funding of this project, we thank the Arts and Humani Humanities Research Council, um, and for our colleagues on the ground, Livingston Museum, Moto Museum in particular, we thank you, and the National Heritage Research Council, Zambia. Uh, they gave us our permit, and without all of these people, this project would not be what it is, and would not be taking place. Thank you from all of us. <laughs>